Melissa Mayer, and uh, I serve at a church called Mercy Street. We meet at uh, Chapelwood United Methodist, so it's kind of like the story. We are a church within the church of Chapelwood, and this year we will celebrate our 20th uh, year in ministry, which is just a crazy thing. But let me add a, a belated happy birthday to the story. I've had the opportunity to worship with you guys on a Sunday morning before, but this is my first time to be in your new space. And I love what is going on in this community. So it's really a great thing to be with you today and to, uh, to celebrate with you. Um, just, I, I said in the earlier service, this is a little bit like a blind date. So some of you are kind of deciding like, shoot, I knew I should have slept in this morning. <laughs> that hour that was robbed from me, I could have been in bed. So uh, let me just tell you a little bit about myself and the community that I serve, and then we're going to dive into the message uh, as well. Uh, I've been a Methodist pastor now uh, for coming up on nine years. Before that, I was in corporate finance, so ministry is a second career for me. I know I look like I'm 16, but I'm not. Uh, moved to Houston from Louisiana, and you can take the girl out of Louisiana, but you can't take the Louisiana out of the girl. You got it. I, uh, I stepped into ministry having no idea what this journey would look like to be a pastor. When I was ordained uh, as a pastor, United Methodist pastor, it had been 151 years since someone in my family had been ordained in ministry. <laughs> 151 years. And come to find out, my great-great-grandfather served at a church here in Houston, Texas, First German Methodist, and they only spoke German. Did you know that? Wow, Houston, Texas. It was 1860. Anyway, enough down memory lane. Uh, as I said, I serve at Mercy Street, and at Mercy Street, when you show up on a Saturday night, we meet Saturdays at 5.30, you could be sitting next to someone who went to Penn State, or the state pen. Just think about that for a second. We say that you, it's very likely you were sitting next to someone that has participated in filing an IPO, an initial public offering on the stock market, or maybe they have just filed a report with their PO, parole officer. Okay? This is likely for someone to be sitting next to you who participates in SLAA and the PTA. So it's this wonderful kind of messy community, um, and uh, for 20 years now, we have been meeting as a part of Chapelwood. Two-thirds of the room on Saturday nights are folks that participate in the 12 steps and are on a journey of recovery, whether it's from alcoholism, drug abuse, uh, addiction to food or relationships, or to work, those that are kind of just working out this messiness of life and are okay to stand in front of uh, their church community week after week and say things like, uh, my name is Rob and I am celebrating 30 days clean today. And the room just erupts in applause. I've been the pastor of this community now uh, for coming up on two years and when I stepped into the community, I don't come from the 12 step tradition. But my own journey of recovery, if we explain recovery in a slightly wider sense, is uh, that for me, my journey of recovery has been one of, at times, dealing with debilitating depression and anxiety. And thanks be to uh, really good friends, to counselors, and to medication, which it took me 15 years to realize that medication is an okay thing. If you had high blood pressure, you would take Lipitor or whatever it is. Uh, but for whatever reason, uh, something had been wired into me that to take medication for depression or anxiety meant that you were weak. And so even as I've claimed that as part of my story but not my whole story, this community of Mercy Street has really been a place that has taught me what hope looks like and that you can have hope in the midst of the messiness of life and that the worst things are never the last things. The worst things are never the last things. So this morning I want to, uh, sure, tell you a little bit about Mercy Street and what's going on, but uh, I really want us to gather around some of the questions that you are asking in these 40 days. 
Uh, last week, Eric asked the question, why is there something rather than nothing? Uh, I love listening to Eric's preaching. I generally have to go look up a few words afterwards. <laughs> Am I alone in that? No? If, Eric, we love you. <laughs> um, this beautiful message of, of wrestling with the creator of the universe. Why is there something rather than nothing? And I love that Eric's landing point in that is that it's because of love. It's because of this, this beautiful, extravagant gift of love that we have been given. And today I want to try to, in my own way, answer the question, what is our purpose? So in 22 minutes today, we are going to just get that locked down. All right? Strap in. Get ready. Uh, no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to offer some of my own thoughts, a few thoughts related to that. Um, but I don't want to miss this opportunity when talking about purpose. Uh, I want to recommend a book to you. If this, is a, if this is a question that you are asking right now. Maybe you find yourself kind of fresh out of college and trying to figure out what the next steps are going to be. On that hour-long commute to work, you are asking the question, what is my purpose? Why am I here? Or maybe it's kids are out of the house for the first time and you have been going from soccer practice to piano lesson to debate practice and now all of a sudden you've got uh, extra time on your hands. Your calendar is not filled with other responsibilities and you find yourself asking this question. What is my purpose? Or maybe you're at some critical point in your career, whether it's retirement or a job change or feeling like you have reached just as, as far as you can go in the company that you're with. What is my purpose? Well, let me recommend a, a book to you. It's called Let Your Life Speak. Has anybody heard of that book? I struck out in the earlier service. No? Nobody? Like one hand? Yes, there we go. Amen, brother. <laughs> Let Your Life Speak. It's uh, by Parker Palmer. Um, if this is a question you're asking, let me just uh, encourage you. If you get nothing out of the message today, read that book. Can you vouch for me? It's an amazing. It's, uh, he has an incredible way of talking about listening as a way of uh, discernment. But I want to try to answer this question today of what is our purpose, perhaps in kind of a broad way, and saying this, what if our purpose, what if the thing that we have been created for was to be people that could carry the message of hope? What if our whole purpose was to take the messiness, the shadows, the brokenness of our lives and to be able to walk through that with some amount of honesty and integrity and willingness and to come out on the other side and say there is hope and to be able to take that message and share it with someone else. There's a quote by uh, another pastor, Frederick Beekner, and he answers this question in this way. He says, the place that God calls you, the purpose that God has for you, is the place where your deep gladness meets the world's deep hunger. That your deep gladness, that place in your life where you, you felt like there were moments where you breathed in joy and life and hope, and that that was the very place that God was inviting you to pour into the life of another, to see the hunger for someone else and to breathe hope into them. See, sometimes we want to answer that question, what is my purpose, and thinking about what we're best at, what are our, our gifts, what are our strengths. But in the narrative, in the story of God, God takes the things that we often think are our failures, God takes those moments and says, says, no, this is what redemption looks like. This is what restoration looks like. This is what hope looks like. And so at Mercy Street on Saturday nights, our service looks a lot like yours. We have uh, opening songs, a time of prayer. Uh, I preach a message, but... But right before I preach, we open up the microphone every single week for a time of celebrations. And it is the moment when the control freak within me says, 
oh dear Lord, please just don't let this go too crazy. And by God's grace, every single week it does. <laughs> People have the opportunity to come forward and to say into the microphone some way that they are celebrating that they have seen God at work in the last week or a way that they have experienced hope. And so people will say into the microphone, today I have 30 days clean. And the whole room just erupts in applause. Another person says, today I am celebrating 27 years clean. And again, the room just erupts in applause. For someone else to say, it has been two weeks since I have self-harmed or purged. And again, applause. For another person to say, I finally landed a job, or I got engaged, or I was able to buy my dream house. And again, the room just erupts in applause. Because what is happening in that moment, in a very real and tangible way, is that someone is sharing their deep gladness, their victory, their triumph, and it is breathing hope into the room. And there, there have been weeks where I've almost wanted to say, like, let, let's just go ahead and sing the closing song, shut it down, because anything I would have to say would just be lanyap. Do you know what lanyap is? A little something extra, Louisiana? Okay, get, so I got two people on that, so we're doubling here. Good, excellent. So the way that we talk about what our purpose is at Mercy Street is we, we try to encourage people to be hope dealers. Now you have to keep in mind that for us that kind of works because it's a room of people that used to be hopeless dope fiends and now they are dopeless hope fiends. Did you get that? Hopeless dope fiends that are now dopeless hope fiends. And so we talk about what does it look like to be a hope dealer? I wanted you to have an opportunity to hear from um, some other folks from Mercy Street besides just me. And I'll, I'll tell you, this is not uh, like a commercial for Mercy Street by any means. They'll talk about Mercy Street, but I want you to hear from them. Folks who know what it is like to, to because of their addiction, have their children placed in the care of someone else's home. They know what it's like to spend time behind bars. They know what it is like to come to the end of themselves. They also know what it is like to say, yeah, the worst things are never the last things. So I want you to hear from them this morning in this video. A life filled with hope is, is so much more, you know, than the life that I was living before. See, I thought I might have had some type of hope. Um, I'm, I'm sure when I was growing up I did, and I lost it in my addiction. And but all those years, even though it's lost, you're still telling yourself on the inside, there's some type of hope, there's something that's gonna happen, um, but there was just no proof of it. So generally what happens, you go with these feelings that last a few days, and then you're right back to where you started again. For a really long time, I thought that hope was a four letter word, that you shouldn't say it, I don't wanna hear it, it's bad. It isn't something that I allowed any room for. I would develop some sort of hope over some situation and then had that hope crush. So it was a series of just really gut-wrenching, heartbreaking events that caused me to think that hope was the worst thing you could ever do. You're setting yourself up for failure. For the longest time, hope was like a foreign concept to me. I just didn't have any and I didn't know how to get it. Um, there wasn't a lot of hope in my life, and um, I had thrived in a chaotic environment. Never thought I'd get married, find love. I would hold down a job. <laughs> my definition of hope back then was, was fantasy. There was hope that you could make parole or something like that, and, but now my definition of hope is Never, ever give up. Never. I love the idea of hope now. Faith is the belief that what we actually hope for will happen. Something that I hoped to have happen is um, I, wanted, I, I would wake up every morning and hope that at some point I could live a life without fear. 
that I could wake up and not be afraid for just one day. Like, that's all I wanted. To actually have that be my life today, I mean, there's lots of crap in my life that is not the way I think it should be. But the fact that I could wake up this morning, come here on my own free will, and not feel the, the, the breath of fear on my neck every step of the way here, you know? That is something I hoped for and then I have, and I really, I really cherish it. When I started just hanging out every weekend at church and just uh, being around such a supportive group of people, my life calmed down. I ended up getting married. <laughs> I've been with my job for five years, so that's, that's hope to me. It wasn't until I found Mercy Street that I finally saw that there was something beyond where I was at. I was in a very dark place, but I found out that, that I could be different, that I could, I didn't have to be invisible. Here, people saw me and they said hi to me and they listened to what I had to say. At Mercy Street, there's proof of people getting better. You can see the person that's been there 10, 15 years in sobriety. See the person that has been the same place as you have and seen their life turn around. And you can also see it from the beginning. Some people brand new to come there, you know, so sad and down. And within weeks or months, they're entirely different people. And so there's a hope that can be seen. It's not just hope that can be talked about, it's hope that can be seen. I don't know how I could have those feelings back then. Knowing and feeling what I, I know and feel now, never give up. It doesn't matter. You've got to keep picking yourself up. doesn't matter what. You're going to make a lot of stupid mistakes, which I have. Oh, man, I have. And I've hurt so many people. People that really love me. Good people. And uh, I, I can't explain my, my shame for that. Uh, uh, but you got to dust your butt up and get up and move. you got to... You gotta keep going forward, you can't give up. Hope, there's hope. Never, ever give up. That's, that's how I'm gonna do things now. I've seen that video dozens of times. But to hear the words of hope from uh, folks that, um, because of decisions they made when they were young or on parole for the rest of their lives, and they talk about hope. Those that have, have been to some of the darkest corners of this city, that they have gone from the boardroom to all of a sudden ending up in a crack house, wondering how they got there. <laughs> and they can talk about hope. Friends, I'll just you know, lay my cards out on the table. I know that, and I love at the story, there is space that is welcome to ask the question, you know, is God real? Is this, is this practice of religion or spirituality worth it? Well, Richard Rohr says this, religion is for people who are afraid of hell. Spirituality is for people who have been through hell. And I love that here at the story, you are looking at this longer, this wider, this eternal narrative of God's story of redemption and stepping into the messiness, sometimes those hellacious corners of our lives and our cities, and being willing to stand and bear a message of hope. Friends, that is something that uh, I believe our world is always in hunger for. It's always yearning that there could be this message of hope, that there is something beyond what we can see in the here and now. And so today we're going to look at uh, two passages of scripture. Um, we'll read one of those uh, together, or I'll read it. Um, but before we do that, I want you to, uh, to turn to your neighbor. When you think about the word hope, what is, it, what is something right now that you are hoping for? And you can make this brutally honest, which is what you're going to order at Cafe Express when the service is over. <laughs> or just something um, maybe a little further out that you are hoping for. So just take just a second. Uh, you can turn to the person that you came with 
Or you can turn to a stranger and just tell them, what is something that you are hoping for right now? Ready? Go. So the next time you maybe find yourself uh, wondering, is there hope? Maybe you can remember what someone else was hoping for, or maybe you could just hear the sound of the rumbling in the room just now. <laughs> that in the midst of what is going on in our city today, there is this undercurrent of hope that is happening. So we're going to look this morning at uh, the Gospel of Mark in chapter 5. Uh, I'll read the passage for us, but if you'll follow along, it'll be on the screens. <clears throat> this, um, this incredible interaction between Jesus and a woman takes place in the midst of kind of a busy and chaotic scene. A woman was there who had been bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a lot under the care of many doctors and had spent everything she had without getting any better. And then the gospel writer lets us know, in fact, she had actually gotten worse. We don't know this woman's name. We don't know what sort of family connections she had. If she was married, did she have children? Who were her neighbors? But we know this, because she had been bleeding for 12 years, because she had a disease that was considered outcast and unclean from others, it was guaranteed that she was living a life of isolation. She was like the person who can be in a crowded room and feel that weight of loneliness. And I recognize in being in the room this morning that this is not a story that is too far from some of you. Whether it's your own journey with um, a medical illness, whether it's cancer or some sort of chronic pain or waiting for the phone call from the doctor to know what the diagnosis or the next step may be. This is a story this morning that hits close to home for some of us here. And so this woman, she had suffered for many years. She'd gone to doctors, spent everything that she had, and she had not gotten any better. In fact, she had gotten worse. But because she had heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his clothes. Because she was thinking, if I can just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. And her bleeding stopped immediately. She could sense in her body that her illness had been healed. And at that very moment, Jesus recognized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and said, who touched my clothes? And I love the disciples. They're like, come on, man. It's Mardi Gras. This place is crowded. What do you mean who touched you? There's people everywhere. Okay, that's not exactly what it say. What does it say here? Yeah, his disciples said to him, don't you see that the crowd is pressing against you and yet you ask, who touched me? But Jesus looked around carefully to see who had done it and then the woman full of fear and trembling came forward. Knowing what had happened to her, she fell down in front of Jesus and told him the whole truth. And he responded to her, daughter, Gosh, when was the last time she heard that word? Besides outcast, unwanted, unclean, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace, healed from your disease. Today I want to talk about that what this woman displays is this resilient type of hope. This hope that, as Ron said in the video, never, ever gives up. You can imagine the amount of isolation, the doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment after doctor's appointment, wondering if she would ever get well, waking up every single morning thinking, 
Maybe today is the day that I am free of this pain and this disease. And yet every morning she was greeted with the same thing. Pain, isolation. And for whatever reason on that day, she hears about Jesus. She hears the miracles that Jesus has been performing for others and she thinks, maybe for me. And so I imagine that in order to make her way through the crowd, she has to put a veil over her, cover herself. She can't even approach Jesus face to face, but she sneaks up behind him and touches his robe. Now for us, that doesn't have a lot of meaning, but in that day and age, to approach a rabbi, someone of authority, and to touch their robe was to literally connect yourself to the source of healing. And she does it, and behold, on this day, unlike any other day, for the last 12 years, she is healed. Now why doesn't the story just end there? Why doesn't this story end with this resiliency that has been uh, blessed for this woman? Two reasons, I think, that Jesus, at this point, calls attention to the crowd. When I read this, I want Jesus to understand, you know, some of us are introverts. You could kind of keep some of this under wraps, Jesus. Not everyone, isn't it? Anyway, that's not one of the points. That was a freebie. Okay, two things about this passage. The first, I think Jesus calls out and says, who has touched me? Not because he wants to shame this woman or to scold her for not doing it the right way. He asks who touched him because he wants to give this woman a chance to finally come out of the shadows, to step out of isolation and say, it was me. He wants to give this woman a chance to claim not only for herself, but to claim for those that are around her, I am healed. That's why at Mercy Street we make this place up front to speak into the microphone, today is 30 days that I am free from this weight of alcoholism. I think Jesus gives this beautiful moment for this woman to claim in community what has happened to her. But the second reason that I think Jesus calls this woman out is that because for this woman, when the next time of the month comes and the bleeding returns, that she can have people around her that can remind her, no, you've been healed. It's those moments where we have experienced the freedom and the healing and the hope of actually being able to step into forgiveness in a relationship that we thought we could never extend forgiveness and we're able to do it. And you feel the weight lift. You feel as if hope has returned for you. And then, dang it, they do something else to uh, make you upset. <laughs> I almost said it. <laughs> And you think, all right, well, that's just, that's too much. We need people in our lives who have celebrated with us in those moments of healing to be able to say, no, you grabbed a hold of forgiveness once before. You can do that again. In our community, it was a few weeks ago, a man who had the courage to stand up and say, after six years, I relapsed. And tonight, I'm clean It's been 24 hours, but I'm clean. And to have the whole room celebrate him and remind him that healing is possible. So I offer this story as a word of encouragement, maybe for someone in the room who feels like I've been... (laughs) I've been hoping day after day after day. Well, Paul says these words, the trials, the suffering, the pain that comes to us is actually a way that we begin to practice perseverance and perseverance produces character and character produces hope. And hope never, ever disappoints us. I believe that with like, 
90% of my being. <laughs> Some days it's 99. <laughs> Eric's talked about last week those two voices in your head, the first voice that is the cynic and the skeptic that kind of says, yeah, uh, hope never disappoints us, but I've been hoping for a long, long time. The other story that I wanna mention today is one that my, uh, my first voice, that part of me that that does believe God is good, but my ace of spades that I always have held on to was this. You could hope in God up to a certain point. And it was the story of Moses. You know, the story of Moses, he leads God's people out of slavery, out of Egypt, and for 40 years, the homeboy has to go on a camping trip. 40 years! quail and manna, people that are complaining, beautiful moments of seeing God's provision in the midst of the wilderness, but every single point of the journey, Moses is saying to the people, just be patient, just have hope, because God has promised to us a land flowing with milk and honey, flowing with crawfish, corn, and potatoes, Thanks be to God, as much as you can eat. Moses preached this message of hope. But damn it, he didn't get to go into the promised land. That was always the part of me. It was like, this this is a great story, but the, the story ends at the end of Deuteronomy with Moses standing on a mountaintop looking into the promised land, saying to the people of God, there it is. And you're gonna enter without me. Because in a split moment, he struck the rock instead of spoke to the rock and God says, the the promised land, you will never enter it. See, there's a part of me, that first voice, that cynic, that skeptic that says, see God, but you're always holding back something. There can be hope, but are you really faithful to your promises? I mean, if you didn't come through for Moses, why for me? So, just uh, a couple of years ago, I was having a conversation with a friend of uh, kind of my own little, we, we have these moments where we have pity parties, right? You know, like, I've just, I keep hoping and hoping and hoping and nothing changes. And I was telling a friend this, and I said, you know, it's, it's the story of Moses. I feel like God kind of holds out before me this promised land and what I think it looks like, and I just... I feel like God said, it's not for you. I love good friends that can be patient with us in the messiness and in the questions, but then can also remind us of truth. And so he looked at me that day and he said, yeah, that, gosh, that's a, that's a tough story. (laughs) And if the story ended there with Moses dying on Mount Nebo, never entering in to the promised land, then that would be a pretty crummy story. He said, Melissa, you haven't, you haven't read the rest of the story. And I'm like, come on, brother, I can Bible sword with the best of them. Deuteronomy, there it is. What are you talking about? He says, fast forward. <laughs> Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus goes to a mountaintop in the promised land, takes with him three of his disciples, and Jesus, not in a dream, not in a vision, but it says Jesus actually has a meeting with Elijah and Moses. We may have these unresolved and unfulfilled hopes, but part of what God is inviting us to see is to have this this vision that is much larger than what we can imagine. And what my friend did for me that day was to restore hope, to say, maybe I can't see exactly how this is going to work out, God. But I mean, Moses got to go to the promised land with Jesus. That's that's pretty darn good. (laughs) 
What is your purpose? What is God's calling for you? Well, maybe it's, it's the place that you have experienced hope, this, this deep gladness, this hope that has come out of the midst of suffering and trials, and this hope that someone you know or may not know is longing for, hungering for. What would it look like to be a hope dealer? There's far too much uh, going on just within our city and our world to have that first voice, that voice of cynicism or skepticism or fatalism that says the way things are is the way things are. I love that here in this community and that we as a people of God, we have another story to tell that God's promises are true, that the worst things are never the last things, and that God's promises are true for you, for me, for Moses, for Robin, for Tony, for Ron, and that's an incredible story to tell. Amen? Amen. Let us pray.